My guest this evening is a multi-instrumentalist. As a member of the legendary Violent Femmes, he has uh, toured the world and entertained thousands and thousands of fans. He also has a, he also has several acting credentials to his impressive resume. Please welcome to the Eclectic Arts Virtual Studio, Blaze Garza. Blaze. Hey, how's it going? Good. How are you? Good. How are things over in Tasmania right now? Yeah, things are actually pretty much back to normal here. We uh, initially had a strong lockdown period when Corona originally hit, but then our active cases died down and we monitored it. Being an island state, we're lucky that we have a barrier of entry via plane or boat. So it's easy to lock down <laughs> in a sense. Um, but we just actually had one new case pop up yesterday from somebody who's visiting from the mainland. So we'll see what happens uh, moving forward. Okay. All right. And you're, you're telling me um, pre-show that uh, you've been over there for about, uh, I want to say five years now. And uh, you had an interesting story about um, your, your interest in Tasmania <laughs> from oh, yeah. a long time ago. If you don't mind sharing that, I think that was uh, really interesting. Sure. Yeah. So when I was in seventh grade, we had to do uh, reports on different places around the world and interesting things. So I did a report on the Tasmanian tiger, uh, which was hunted to extinction in the in the 30s, I believe. And um, <clears throat> that was my initial interest with Tasmania was that seventh grade report. Um, fast forward years later, I'm playing with the FEMS and I find out we're going to play down in Tasmania in 20, 2015, this was. And um, that was my first time actually visiting here. And I just fell in love with it. I had 11 days on my visa to explore. And I spent all 11 days hiking around, exploring as much of the island as I could. I fell in love with it and decided I want to move here. And then I moved back for a year to see if I really liked living there. And then after a year living, of living here, I, uh, I decided, yeah, this is, this is where I want to be. And so I've been yeah. here since. Yeah, that's that's amazing. I mean, I'm sure when you think back to when you were writing that report, you probably never thought in your wildest dreams that you would be living in Tasmania. Yeah, <laughs> it's funny. Uh, it comes full circle, right? Yeah, you know, li life's interesting that way. You just never know where things are gonna, you know, come your way and how they're gonna work out. And um, so let's kind of obviously jump right into the violent films. And you've been with the band about 15 years. You're uh, kind of letting me know and. So how did you get involved with that? Uh, with that, How did that gig come to you 15 years ago? Yeah, so I originally was studying saxophone with a, a professor in San Diego named Jay Easton, and he's a classical saxophonist. So I was studying classically. Um, and Jay was uh, invited to, to perform this piece, this upcoming, this award-winning composer's piece, like a young composer. And the piece featured a saxophone solo. Now, originally, Jay was meant to premiere this piece, but he had a scheduling conflict and suggested me at the age of 14 to the composer. So I went up there and auditioned, which, you know, being that young, I could understand it would be a bit concerning. So I did a good job on the audition and I ended up getting the part. And um, then there was a bit, of, a little bit of a news write up about the concert and about me. And so that was up in the coffee shop where my mom worked with a couple of pictures of me with my saxophones. And there was a roadie for the Femsies to come into the coffee shop named Zip. And um, so he knew about me through my mom and my, my sax playing. And then he told Brian, who's the bass player of the Femmes, about me and uh, about my saxophone collection. And Brian invited me out to meet, to see the show. And then I ended up sitting in with them that night. And, um, I did a good job and then I got to sit in with them the next night and for many years they called me every time they were on the west coast to sit in and join and then now years later after after the band has gotten back together uh, I'm a full-time member so see that's just like we were talking about like um when you're writing the report for Tasmania would you ever thought that you were going to be living there and then here's this roundabout way that through taking classical saxophone lessons and your professor couldn't do the part. And then there's a newspaper article in your mom's work. And uh, I mean, this, these things, you could not predict that these things would happen the way they did. Um, but you get to sit in with the band and then they yeah, eventually become a full member of the band. That's, that's an amazing story. Yeah. And I'll tell you another, just a, another funny little story. Um, 
So the first live concert I ever saw was Bare Naked Ladies. My parents took me to see them in San Francisco when I was, I don't know, I must have been either in, in third or fourth grade, but this was before I was playing any, any instruments. And um, then fast forward years later, we ended up touring with Bare Naked Ladies and I ended up sitting in with them every night playing uh, saxophone. Uh, Colin Hay was on this tour. Colin Hay is the singer from the lead singer for Men at Work. So we would close out the show, or there would be a special part of the show where I would join in the Bare Naked Ladies with Colin Hay, and we would do Who Can It Be Now. So that was mm -hmm. a really cool tour. And then I told the guys, like, "Hey, this is the first. You guys are the first show I ever saw." And then, you know, now I'm playing with you. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, no, that's very cool. That's got to be, uh, you know, very much a you know a mind trip when you were first doing that, thinking back. This is the first band I ever saw when I was in third or fourth grade, and now I'm touring with them all around America and playing all these, you know, uh, amphitheaters and um, outdoor venues and things. Because I know we're going to be showing a clip uh, from what you just talked about. So, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So everybody, okay, that out there... was a cool concert. Actually, when we were playing, my buddy Jeff, who who um, did backup guitar and stuff with the Femmes for a while. He, he bumped me on the shoulder and he's like, look, just take it in. And I looked at all the people's faces and just had this overwhelming sense of happiness, which was just really cool. Yeah, I, I got a chance to cover uh, the Bare Naked Ladies, uh, obviously not at Red Rocks, um, but here, here in Seattle. And it was an outdoor uh, sold out show. It was them and um, Better Than Ezra and Katie Tunstall were on the bill. And it's just people were just having a good time. I mean, there was like just nothing but positive vibes. And uh, so I know exactly what you're talking about in terms of uh, that feeling. But that venue, of course, is legendary. Um, and uh, yeah, when I was watching the clip that we're going to be showing in maybe 10 or 15 minutes, it was like, man, look at all those people. You know, they're all up on their feet and they're all having a great time. And uh, for someone like me, you know, having Colin Hay singing that song, and there's another kind of connection to you, you know, him being from Australia. <laughs> and Actually, yeah. Another funny thing, uh, I, I ended up applying for a permanent residency down here and Colin actually wrote a letter of recommendation for me. So yeah, that was very helpful. Thank you, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> wow, all, yeah, all these things that, yeah, those, again, just that six degrees of separation, whatever you want to call it, how things have you know turned out for you in certain circumstances. That's, that's awesome um, to hear those kind of stories. I know I'm just speaking as a fan myself, I love hearing that kind of thing. Um, so let's kind of also, as I was mentioning to you uh, pre-show, when people see the uh, contrabass saxophone um, with the femmes or with any um, other artist that you're uh, playing with, they don't really quite know exactly what to make of that because at least when I saw you in Seattle, they thought it was a toy or a prop or like you weren't actually going to play that. It's just like some kind of big thing off in the corner. And then you obviously you get on there and you play it and they're kind of like just like dumbfounded about what, like what is that because the people behind me kept saying what the hell is that thing and see he's not going to play that is he and then they watch it go over there and play it so for those out there that aren't familiar with uh, the various uh, saxophones can you talk about the contrabass saxophone and um, everything that's entailed with it yeah so the contrabass saxophone is and was for many many years the largest member of the saxophone family um, Adolf Sax invented or patented the sax in the 1840s and in his original patent, he had a range from uh, sopranino through contrabass and actually an included extended range down to what would be a subcontrabass saxophone. Now, the subcontrabass saxophone, like a, a real one, wasn't made for many, many years. But now that that exists, the contrabass saxophone is no longer the largest one. <laughs> but for all intents and purposes, it, it's a six foot tall six foot four actually tall saxophone that weighs 55 pounds. So it's, it, it definitely is something to look at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Um, and uh, so like, um, how many contrabasses do you have? Do you have one, two, and then also how do you transport that thing when you're on the road? Yeah, so th the full size contrabass, the one I play with the FEMS in the States is, is the main contrabass sax that I use, but I do have a short wrapped version, which is called a two bax, which is about um, half the height. So it's a lot more compact that I use in Australia and overseas. And the main reason is the case for the contrabass is so large and it's an awkward shape. It, it, it ends up being very costly and hard to find transport for it. Whereas the two bax is nice because it's compact and it fits in a really good road case that can go on an airplane. <laughs> Okay, no, that, that makes perfect sense. Um, and 
just do you know off the top of your head like how many contra bases are saxophones are there in the world i mean there are a lot of them or just maybe like we're talking a few dozen or yeah um i'm, I'm not sure on the exact number i think that orsi the company that made my saxophone made 12 of them and i know that throughout the years various other companies have made contra bass saxophones but there are now a, a handful of companies that are making them as special order. There's a company in Brazil, there's an instrument maker in um, Europe, and I, I believe even in like China and in some places in Asia now, the extended larger instruments are being made. So there's more access to them than ever before, which is great. So hopefully these instruments um, become more into the mainstream and get more use because they're really interesting and really cool. and. Uh, they undeservedly don't have enough feature pieces, in my opinion. Yeah, no, uh, well said. Um, and it kind of brings us to, I guess, the, uh, the other point is like, I, I know that you started off as an actor and then you got yourself into music. Um, maybe we should actually start that way. So let's kind of go all the way back. So when you're starting off as an actor, uh, what got you into that realm of the arts? And then what got you over to um, uh, the, the music side of things? Yeah, so I was actually a pageant kid. Uh, my mom put me in like singing talent show pageant type things as a child. And I was entered in this kid search contest, which was a nationwide contest. I think it was for like America's cutest kid or something like that. And um, the prize for that was to go out to New York and go on a, an audition, like a, a real audition. So we went out to New York and I went on an audition and uh, it was for I believe it was a cinnamon life cereal commercial and I ended up getting the part and that was kind of my first break into acting and then um, I ended up shortly thereafter getting a role on the soap opera another world which I was on for two years and then I did acting from that point onward but my parents are both in the military and so being in a military family we, we moved around quite a bit so with the restationing being on the show uh, was no longer possible because we weren't living anywhere near New York at the time. We ended up moving to Virginia and I, my mom was driving from Virginia up to New York for shooting a couple times a week and then back. Then we got stationed in Pensacola, Florida and the drive, we did it once. And it, she was like, yeah, I don't think you can be on the show anymore. Um, but yeah, so, so I did minor acting things up to about middle school age. And um, then I started getting really into music um, I still did acting like a, I was in a handful of commercials and, and a, a few films throughout my high school and college um, ages as well. But at that point, music had kind of taken my focus. Okay. And um, when you think back about the, the acting opportunities, like you mentioned being on Another World, and I think it was for about uh, maybe two years or so, if I, if I remember correctly. Um, and granted, you were you know a very young child at that point, but what do you remember about that experience working on, uh, you know, a soap opera, which is kind of a grind. There's always, you know, new scripts and new things for you to learn and you don't have a lot of time to memorize your lines and that kind of thing. Yeah. It's, it's hard to see what do I remember about the experience. Right. Um, but I guess I, I remember not really having a hard time with the lines and it was more just kind of, I just felt like I was being myself, which I guess is probably good for a child actor to just play a child, you know, <laughs> But um, yeah, it was cool to be thrust into that into that world at a young age and to have a a sense of um, professionalism that young, I guess, and how to work with people at different ages, different, et cetera. Okay, and did you have um, since you were shooting X amount of days a week? Did you have to actually do your education on set, or could you do it at home or in you know privately or homeschool or a public school? Yeah, it's a bit of all of that, actually. Um, so when I was on the on Another World, we had a set teacher, and I would mostly do all my work on set. But then when we were when we were moving around, uh, there was a year my mom homeschooled me, and then um, just a combination of being in whatever school I was in and uh, having a set school, depending on if I was shooting. Okay. But for the most part, I was in a regular school system. Okay. All right, and then like you mentioned, then um, you're still doing acting things, but then you, uh, you know, music really started to become your focus. Uh, did you know that you wanted to start with the saxophone, or were you thinking of any other instrument? Or no, this. Um, so when I was in fifth grade, the band 
was now an option for class that you could take. And I thought, oh, that sounds cool, but I didn't know anything about any instruments. And my parents took me to a pawn shop and I thought the saxophone looked the coolest. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. And then um, yeah, quickly fell in love with it and found out there were other types of saxophones. Um, so the baritone sax, which is traditionally the lowest used member of the saxophone family um, became my favorite. And I played that through middle school and high school. And I would say that that's, that's my favorite horn. Okay, yeah, I, I can relate to a certain extent because I remember in fifth grade as well, um, I took a sheet of paper home to my parents and it was about signing up for band and they had the different instruments that you could sign up for. And uh, I started with saxophone, but it was with, with an alto, um, which I only played through elementary and junior high. And then when I got to high school, all of my friends were getting pretty serious about their instruments. And I was still just kind of doing it for fun. So I decided I wasn't gonna pursue band into high school. I had to kind of make that decision. Um, and it, I think it actually was probably the right decision because I was playing guitar at that point too. So I started going on the guitar track and being in bands and all that kind of stuff. And those other guys were getting serious about their jazz and everything else that they needed to do. Um, so, Hey, I think this is a perfect time to set up the video clip that you sent to us. And you actually kind of mentioned it earlier. So what are the fans out there going to be seeing for the next uh, four or four and a half minutes? Yep. So this is taken from when I was on tour with Bare Naked Ladies Violent Femmes and Colin Hay. So this is a, was a live filming of our concert at Red Rocks, which is actually the very, very first time I ever played with Colin Hay and Bare Naked Ladies. So yeah, that was my very first time performing with them. <laughs> wow, that's, uh, no, see, there's some more behind the scenes stuff, which I love. So uh, if the fine folks down in LA and Alice could run the video clip of Blaze, that would be awesome. Practice or prep, but um, one thing I want to make sure that I have a chance to talk about was that, um, Blaze, you've been doing a lot of things with um, Cirque and acrobatics, and um, I know you did some competitive cheerleading um, many years ago, so can you kind of speak to uh, the Cirque things that you've been up to? Yeah, so as of 2018, I started touring with this Australian Cirque company called Strut and Fret, and they do a multitude of shows around the world, um, including things like Madonna's private birthday party or, you know, corporate events to full on productions, you know, large scale. They actually had a show in Vegas um, for a while as well. But the show I was in, involved with is called Life the Show, which is one of their productions. And in that show, I play saxophone, but I also fly on a wire harness around the venue. So they pull me along on a winch while I'm doing flips and playing sax. And uh, we actually play Madness One Step Beyond uh, during that. So I'm running through the air, playing one step beyond doing flips. It's, it's actually quite a, quite a production. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, uh, <laughs> that sounds amazing. Uh, and, uh, just, the uh, how, like how much training did you have to do before you did your first live performance in front of an audience for Cirque? Yeah. So I did get a little bit of training, um, at like a gym, a private gym with an actual rigger on a pulley system. So the rigger was actually riding the truss, jumping up and down, which is cool way to, to practice. But I was a little nervous at first getting whipped off the air 20 feet while also trying to play a sax riff and keep the sax steady, you know. Um, but I think I got about about four or five rehearsals in before we did the first performance, the first live show. And um, I picked it up pretty quick, though, because like you had mentioned earlier, I have a bit of a tumbling background, which I got into when I was 17. I, I was really into parkour and I was doing parkour and trying to do flips off the wall at my school. And the cheer coach saw me and he's like, you're gonna hurt yourself. You should come into the gym and I'll teach you how to tumble correctly. <laughs> so then fast forward a year and a half later, I, I'm, I'm competing uh, with the California All-Star cheerleading team. And we got to compete in many um, national competitions. So yeah, with the tumbling and the stunting background kind of transitioned easily into the circ world because I already had an awareness of my body and how to and how my body moves in space. So it's just a matter of combining the playing with the body awareness. You, you have such an interesting, your, your past of how they've led to different things in your life, you know, things from 15, 20 years ago, just like you were saying, you know, when you're in high school, you're doing these things and then here you're you know, in 2018, then you're doing circ by playing saxophone while you're getting winched around. It's like, yeah. uh, you, you couldn't make this stuff up. I mean, it's awesome. Yeah, I'm hearing all these different uh, fascinating fast, uh, facts, facets of your life. Um, and I definitely want to talk about something that you've been doing very recently, 
with uh, your Trailblaze series where you have pictures and, and videos. Can you speak to that for those that don't know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So again, I live in Tasmania and Tasmania is uh, just world renowned stunning uh, wilderness. And there's a lot of amazing hikes here and mountains and rivers and streams to explore. Some, some parts of Tasmania are so remote that, you know, people may have never been there or people haven't been there for thousands of years, you know, and that I find really fascinating. So I've been, I've been really exploring and hiking as much of Tasmania as I can and trying to go to um, interesting locations. And I've actually filmed a significant amount of footage that I'm just in the process of editing, but that is my series Trailblaze, which is kind of a hiking series. And I hope to eventually when, when touring happens again, I hope to expand that so that it's not just Tasmania. And when I was in California, I like to hike, you know, wherever I am hiking is really important to me. And um, eventually, like I said, I'd like to expand it into a hiking series around the world. But for now, it's a hiking series focused in Tasmania. <laughs> Okay, and uh, again, for people out there that haven't had a chance to check it out, please do. I was watching some of the videos, and like what Blaze said, there's some breathtaking scenery and um, just getting a better idea of what the landscape's like in Tasmania because, you know, most people don't really know, uh, especially here in America. And um, uh, it's almost like it reminds me of something you would maybe see on Travel Channel or Discovery Channel. Like I could completely see this became like a TV series of yeah, Trailblaze with Blaze Garza. And, <laughs> and, I, and there he is because it's, it's really fascinating watching it places that you go to so um i know with the pandemic in different parts of the world it's kind of hard to know or hard to say but uh, do you have any kind of projects uh future projects that either you're working on or that are kind of coming up in the next uh, few months yeah so like i said we we're fortunate in that we have a handle on our covid cases here so we actually can have live concerts and, and, and brian from the fams lives down here as well he and i are actually doing a concert on the 23rd of august which I'm really excited about it'll be in a cathedral it's a limited amount of people can attend but it'll be my first concert back since everything kind of happened and I'm, I'm really looking forward to it so we'll be doing for that it's it's not feminist music it's going to just it's going to be like a bit of Japanese music a bit of jazz a bit of classical music um with with other performers so looking forward to that oh that sounds amazing yeah and that's awesome that you can do that in uh, maybe about what 10 days or so from now um, and uh, do you guys still have any kind of plans for um, the fall in terms of Australia or New Zealand it just kind of depends on how things go yeah it kind of just depends on how things go unfortunately okay well at least you get a chance to be you know, doing the cathedral show it's a lot more than uh, everyone else can see out there so hey Blaze thank you so much for taking the time it was fascinating talking to you and uh, I've had a kind of chance to see you live in February here in Seattle. Now I get a chance to talk to you virtually. And so I really appreciate you taking the time and I hope you stay safe down there in Tasmania. And um, is there anything else you'd like the, the fans to know before we uh, depart? Stay safe. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Take care and uh, have a good rest of your Thursday down there. Thanks. Have a good night. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.